Matt. Hi, Tim. Now, I actually suggested this as a title for our conversation, Don't Call Me a Streetwear Designer, and you agreed. I wonder why you agreed. Because I trust you. Well, that's your first mistake. Um, <laughs> I, um, no, I'm curious because what we've... Uh, we, first of all, over the last decade, or maybe even the last five years, we saw streetwear redefining menswear. We saw what amounted to a style revolution almost. The people who were responsible for that are now moving away from the label very, very consciously. Um, I'm curious as to whether streetwear now strikes you as a curse, where it was once a blessing, that label anyway. <clears throat> yeah, it's a very um, loaded term, like, like luxury as well. There's so many um, people view that label streetwear in so many different ways. For me, you know, fashion is always something that's really personal. And because um, I come from California, where skateboarding and surfing and a time when uh, rap music was, was really growing in the 90s. That was all part of my uh, formative years. So that naturally influences, uh, you know, my taste. But that doesn't mean that I'm, you know, uh, not inspired by fashion and art and all these things. And, um, you know, streetwear brands in the past, you know, they have communities. And I think maybe sometimes if you have... Uh, a community around you that's connected to street culture. People assume that the work that you do is, is entitled streetwear. But, um, you know, that's kind of my feelings about that. Well, I, th I think uh, you, you are actually part of, uh, it's almost legendary now, the bean trill <laughs> uh, combination. Yeah. What would you call that? Bean trill? What, what do you Collective. call yourself? Collective. Yeah. And that was Virgil Abloh, that was Heron Preston, and there was even rumors that, that Kanye West was part of it. Yeah. Um, what, what did that, you, you mentioned community there, that, that is kind of interesting to me. What, what, did, what did bean trill mean in, in its moment, apart from being this sort of crucible that it seems like something yeah. has come out of? It, it was something, it was just a group group of friends having fun and, you know, at, at the time I was working with Kanye as an art director and we were touring a lot and, um, you know, each, each place we went to, we, we threw a party and played the music that we wanted to hear. And that kind of coincided with, um, you know, a time in New York where, uh, you know, there was a lot of designers coming up, like uh, Hood by Air was just starting, I was beginning, Virgil was beginning. And um, yeah, it just, it, it was just a, a moment, you know, it wasn't too well planned out or, or thought, thought out, you know. I'm curious, I, when, I, when I read about Bean Trill, one of the comments that people make, apart from the fact that it was very limited, you did very, very small drops when you did the closes, they were also extremely expensive. So right away, you, you established that kind of, that kind of, you made that point that streetwear isn't necessarily cheap wear. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, I mean, it was really just a reaction to, to the moment. You know, Instagram was just starting. We had the hashtag and our logo. Um, and we were just, you know, doing things that, that we were inspired by in that moment. I mean, streetwear, you know, uh, isn't always inexpensive. There's lots of Japanese brands that are, in, you know, people consider streetwear, like Capital is, is one that, that uh, you know, a lot of people in street culture wear right now, and some of those, those jackets are, you know, thousands of dollars, and you, it's one of the only things you can actually uh, not get on the internet. You have to, like, go there to the store and see what's available, so I think, you know, if streetwear, I think, ori really originates in Harajuku, and that whole format of, of drops and uh, you know, Hiroshi Fujiwara, uh, Jun Takahashi, that, that whole scene, Nigo, um, you know. But, you know, that's, uh, they're a few generations above me. I, uh, with them and with you, um, you, you talk about community. I think the idea of the cult was equally appealing and, and maybe even more seductive. That that you created this cult. Um, those designers created a cult around themselves. You created a cult as well. I feel 
that's something you'd have, I feel that's something that Virgil quite consciously did as well, to create this sort of mystery. And I think it's something that, um, that you still cultivate in a way, that Alix, there's something mysterious mm. about the label, there's something mysterious about the name. Um, is, that, is that a deliberate thing then? Do you think, that, do you think that's a sort of useful, useful association to have? No, I mean, when, when I started in fashion, um, you know, streetwear and the, the, the kind of brands and things we were interested in was really outside of the, you know, the conventional fashion industry. So we just created our own uh, community and our own projects and own events. And, you know, over the course of, it's been like 15 years at this point, you know, people along the way, um, participate, uh, engage in the thing. So that kind of, I think, culminates into having a natural following. You know, it's not like I just started a leaks one day and it was my, f you know, my, my first thing. So, um, I'm not that strategic, you know, <laughs> how would you describe the evolution? Because visually it's been super strong. It, it, it I, has, I, I think what was really fortunate of me is working with, um, you know, musicians, you know, when I, cause coming from LA, there wasn't much fashion happening there. So working in entertainment, making costumes, that was like a way to... For Lady Gaga. Yeah, and, and Kanye. Um, you know, it was a way to do really creative clothing. Um, it was a way to travel the world. So then when I, when I started the brand, um, I had great relationships in, in different cities around the world and a lot of support, which was, which was really fortunate, you know. Uh, the, we we were talking before about about LA and and how if, if I think immediately of two designers who have made an impact in fashion, it's you and it's Rick Owens, and it's so interesting that coming from the land of eternal sunshine, <laughs> we have two guys whose whose shtick is is black to the point of gothic, <laughs> and. Um, I think the notion of the shadow and the sunshine is always so powerful. It's like the sort of essence of film noir. Uh, I wondered if that, how, how much of your aesthetic is shaped by a reaction to sort of sunshine and orange juice and surfing and so on. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's hard to say, but Rick is definitely a huge inspiration for me. Um, just being independent, uh, you know, moving, you know, he produces in Italy, working with his wife. It, there's a lot of similarities there. But I think, um, you know, California encapsulates all, you know, a wide range of, of those emotions and dark and light. And I think everybody has their, their own experience, you know. Well, it, it, you, you reacted against California the way he did. He moved to Paris. At least he moved to Paris. Yeah. It's like a, you know, big city. You moved to Ferrara. Yeah. <laughs> so you took yourself right out of the loop. And I can imagine that that was, it seemed like a very deliberate thing to do, but it seemed like a deliberately difficult thing to do. So I was curious about, you yeah. uprooted your family, you moved to yeah. a small town in Italy. Why did you do that? Well, I'm, I'm really like a product person. I, I really care about how things are made. Um, you know, we develop lots of materials. Um, you know, spend lots of time with the manufacturers, and I had worked with other brands over the course of my career, and it proved really difficult to make the kind of product I wanted to make anywhere outside of um, Italy. So I just uh, showed up and, you know, started meeting people, driving and to factories, like, and just figured it out. And, um, you know, I think it was just, it was just one of the sacrifices uh, that had to be made, you know. And learned Italian in a week with a Rosetta Stone. Or <laughs> I can speak fashion, you know. That's all you need to speak. <laughs> Which you, um, the universal language. Uh, is that something you would advise? Um, it seems that, because it seems like your career has some, has some very clear lessons in it for people who would like to be you. Is that something you would advise people? That that there's a sort of it, it depends. focus and a purity in that approach. Yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, for me, it was really like Italy is one of the, the last places where, where everything is really made there, you know? Obviously, in China, Japan, there, you can make everything, but to have that access to, to from, you know, yarn to finished garment, um, be able to make something 
things can be driven in a, in a short distance. It, you know, making stuff in New York, having fabric imported, um, even just like th there's not an ability to scale. You know, you can make 50 of, of something, but can you make 500 of that, you know? So um, that kind of, you know, really determined where I went, you know? Um, but How did it influence the actual design process? Well, a lot of times um, I'll design into like the strength of the factory. So if they're really like uh, proficient in uh, leather or working with some material or have some techniques. I mean, um, there's so much uh, craftsmanship that, that still exists there um, that can be unlocked and applied in different ways. And I'm really interested in that idea of, of modern craft and, and what that means. You know, with an industrial edge too. I mean, I think of your accessories, uh, the safety belt buckle, yeah. which is kind of your signature. Yeah. And would that not have happened, do you think, if you hadn't had access to the sort of Italian... That's actually craft? made in, uh, in Austria. I, I, uh, I just discovered the, the people that, that made it and, and contacted them. But I think what's special about that is that it's, it's not made in a, with a fashion supplier. It's made with like a, a company that makes car engines and, and things like that. So there's, um, uh, I don't know, like a, an unseen residue that exists on that, that product that makes it feel different than if it was made, um, you know, in a normal fashion supply chain. Do you feel mildly irritated that other people seem to be copying you with that? No, not at all. Like, it's, it's okay, you know, it's fine. It's virtual. <laughs> uh, something else that's, I think, very strong in the Alik story is the fact that, well, as, as I said, you moved your family to Ferrara. And the, the Alik seems very much like a symbiotic expression of you and your wife Jennifer that yeah. I walk into we were just in Toronto last week and lo and behold there was an Alix pop-up uh, which was a real surprise um, but when I walked into the, sh the store her presence was extremely strong when you look at the clothes it's yeah. very much you have like a, a kind of an inspiration and a muse on your right shoulder the whole yeah time. yeah my wife Jennifer and I started the brand together and it's named after our, our daughter um, you know, she's designed many of our best products, like our, our best-selling bag. She did all the sales uh, for for the past five years of the brand. So, um, I mean, she's an equal part of the success as I am. And, and uh, you know, I really want to celebrate and recognize her for, for everything she's done. It's not possible without her, you know? Well, I, I love the precision in the brand, if I, if, I could say, if I could say one thing that defines a leak, is that you have mastered tailoring, um, which is usually a huge, that's a kind of make or break thing from when a brand, say especially a brand that started in something like streetwear, evolves. Uh, it's something like that fundamental principle of fashion yeah. that people fall down on. And this is where I think um, a leaks is different from your, uh, you're different from your peers because there feels to be, there feels to me like a genuine element of, um, of fashion knowledge and craft of this precision. Is that innate or is, yeah. is that something that you're acquiring as you go on? Well, I think that's one beautiful thing about fashion is like each category is like, it takes a life, lifetime to master. If you, for shoes, knitwear, leather, tailoring and there's always something you're, uh, you know, to learn. But I, I strongly believe like that we shouldn't make something unless we're going to be able to make it at the highest level. And I didn't do, um, you know, traditional tailoring until we were able to work um, with, with masters of, of, uh, of tailoring. We work with Caruso, which is an amazing supplier um, that, you know, has really taught me how to, how, to, how to make tailoring in the best way. You know, before that we did more like unstructured jackets and, and things like that. So it's just about, you know, taking the time and, and baby steps. But I really try to find uh, a supplier and, and, uh, and learn and be taught and, and educated how to make that, that specific uh, category as best as possible. I think that's instructive for 
somebody who would be you. I mean, that's another, that's another very good point. That how do the hype beasts respond to, to that? Uh, when, when, you know, we, we know about these, these fanat fanatics who, do, you, do they queue up to buy your Nike collaboration? Do they mob the I stores? don't check in on that. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming they do, um, if, I, if, if the online response is any indication. But how do, the, how do they respond to this, to, to what you're doing with your clothes? Yeah, you know, I think as a designer, we always need to be proposing uh, what the future could look like or new ideas. And I, I kind of see myself as maybe like a bridge for, for a lot of um, maybe those kids that are first into a sneaker or a t-shirt that then, you know, through leaks, they can find out about tailoring or, um, you know, leather, leather pieces, things like that. Um, so I, I feel like, pe you know, people are open to it. I, I feel that's something Virgil's trying to do as well, that lifting, you know, elevating the taste level of, of his fans. But with you, because it's so, I say precise again, it's so sophisticated. Thank you. And it's so, um, in a way, you, you, you seem to be expecting a lot of, of your customers because the work is very elevated. Yeah, I think we have a, a really broad customer range, also depending on what country in the world um, that we're selling in. So I think that's, that's a really beautiful thing about the brand is that it, it speaks to you know, a really wide range of, of And how ages. are you reaching out to them? Um, like that pop-up, for example. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and shop in shops with, with different, uh, different partners of ours and stuff like that. Two days ago, you were in Aspen, yeah, launching a new Nike collaboration. How significant has that been for yeah. the growth of your career? Huge. Um, it was amazing to to have the support of Nike for the past three years. Um, you know, on the training collection that I do with them, um, just working with their team, seeing how um, they approach product and communication. Um, you know, each time we do one of those collaborations, there's so much learning that happens in it. What's the dialogue between Nike and Elix? I mean, yeah, well, they're, so very, they're very distinct. Product. Yeah, the, the Elix product that we do is more like lifestyle based. And then uh, the stuff with my own name is more like innovation. So taking uh, uh, the materials and product that, that Nike's really developing and innovating and then applying it to the, to the training category. And, and what do you imagine will happen going forward then with they are two. They are two directions, and uh, I'm. I, I'm really. Each collection with the leaks is so, such a leap from the one before. What 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 happens next? I think just building on on what we've already done. Yeah, are we referring to the leaks or or the new Nike I'm collections? Referring to the leaks because the tailoring element, for example, in each collection is is more and more rigorous each time. You're heading towards this, this point of real purity. Uh, it's an interesting, it's an in, I, I, feel, I feel again that's, that's, that's anticipating something because I think we've had the Gucci, you know, the glut of decoration and, and um, eccentricity and so on. And do you feel that now the world, the, world, the, the world's appetite, fashion appetites are heading towards something? stricter, more minimal. It's interesting because like, you know, I named named the Elix after my daughter and and everything about this project is really personal. Like I felt like um it needed to be that way because you know, there's so many clothes in the world, there's so many um things that are are really just about selling or um uh, and I and I felt like for me to to do a project that was really like committed and a lifelong project it needed to be personal. So Every time I'm thinking about a collection, it's really about, you know, what does it mean to live today? What, what is relevant for clothes to be today? How can these pieces be timeless? And um, I think that's just kind of leading me to, to what those collections look like and, um, and building on, on stepping stones that we've laid in the past. So as far as like, I think so many brands and, uh, you know, they have a place for all different types of people and customers, but our project is really about um, 
what I what I feel is relevant to me and and you know the circle of people around me. And, and what yeah, what is that relevance? We've heard so much over the last couple of days yeah. about the challenges that are facing the world and then the challenges that are facing the fashion industry, but you're actually the one voice over the two days that is the voice of high fashion, the, the ambassador for the, okay. the very upper uppermost <laughs> stratum in a way. So what what constitutes relevance in, in that in that uh, area? Yeah, I mean I think it's different for each each person for for each product, you know what I mean? Um, I, it's easier to answer for like say the Nike collections, you know what I mean? Like uh, with with active where I really like the concept of season seasonless clothing, you know, using technology that, you know, the the jacket could be used in winter or or summer. That means you have to buy less, consume less. You have to you can you can make less product. Maybe for leaks, it's thinking about sustainability uh, for items that that people keep for a less amount of time, like T-shirts or socks or underwear. How can those things be using uh, recycled materials? Or uh, say it's a leather jacket. How can that be something that is really made of the highest quality and it's going to last for decades and maybe be end up in a secondhand shop or be yeah. passed down to a a friend or a relative, thinking about yes. these kinds of, of concepts and applying them to each, uh, each individual That item. is an interesting facet of sustain fashion sustainability is less but better. So Yeah, and, and also just teaching people about value. I think that's a huge part of, of sustainability is, I think clothes, clothes have been made to be too inexpensive and people don't appreciate them enough. You know what I mean? Um, we're doing a project with Vibram next year where we're going to be offering um, a leaks sole repair kits. So basically, this truck is going to go around and, and repair any shoe that you bring, whether it's like cup sole, leather, leather shoe, vulcanized. We're going to go to skate parks, r repair kids' shoes. Just the idea that because something wears down, it doesn't mean you need to buy a new thing. Like you can repair it, you know what I mean? But you're also making these fabulous hybrid shoes that are, you know, shoe, one, one pair of shoes for all the moods you are. Yeah, that, that was also like another sustainable concept because um, a really hard thing about recycling is when you mix polymers. So that, that sole's a single polymer, it's just rubber. So the idea that you could just wear that sole out, it could be reground and a, and a new sole could be made. Um, and then it's also not, you know, necessarily ruining the shoe that, it, that it's around, you know what I mean? Well, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, congratulations, and very excited to see what happens with the leaks. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Thank you.